Um, just for those of you who might not know me, let me just tell you that the main programme we do is a, a show called Soccer Saturday on Sky Sports, which is a football show with a difference because there's no football. You know, you don't see any shots, any near misses, you don't see any goals. So it's very much like watching Leeds United, really. Um, <laughs> But what, what we have is a panel of people who tell you what you're missing. So it's an interesting concept. I mean, at the moment, that panel sitting next to me is Matt Letizier. Um, now, talented footballer, no question about that. It was the Spanish player, Xavi, who said uh, he, he's an incredible talent. It's as if he walks past people. Well, he does walk past people because he was such an idle so-and-so that he would never raise a trot. Uh, I always thought he would be on television, but... I always thought Benefit Street more likely than Soccer Saturday. But, um, and before that, George Best was there, and, and the great Frank McClintock and Rodney Marsh. It was a really spiky character. You know, I'm often asked why people take an instant dislike to Rodney, and I tell him it saves time. Um, on the panel now, we've got uh, Charlie Nicholas and Phil Thompson. Uh, and Paul Merson, who is unique to English football punditry. <laughs> in that he speaks no English. <laughs> you know, you've seen the programme, you, you'll know. He, he's hit the beans. I hit the post, the beans on toast. Um, or he's off the Judy, off the bench, the Judy Dench, you know. <laughs> or what's the score, Merce? It's Desmond, 2-2. Two, two. Um, he's, got, he's got complete language of his own, but he is a fantastic character as well. Um, you know, lots of, lots of people who I sit alongside are um, really interesting characters and all very different. I, and one of the other different things about Soccer Saturday, of course, is, you know, whereas we've all heard of malapropisms, um, we have cami-propisms, which are the speciality of Chris Kamara. Um, the balls just run either side of the post. <laughs> or um, it's nil-nil at half-time, Jeff, but it could easily be the other way. Um, <laughs> it's end-to-end -end stuff, Jeff, but it's all at the forest end. That, that, that's Chris Kamara. But look, I, you know, I can gently poke fun at them all, and then I think to myself, George Best, possibly, you know, the greatest footballer that I've ever seen. Um, Roddy Marsh, ex-England international. Frank McClindock, Arsenal double winning captain, Phil Thompson, European Cup winner with Liverpool, Charlie Nicholas, ex-Arsenal, uh, Celtic, Scotland, uh, Matt Letizia, ex-England, Chris Kamara, ex, well, Swindon Town, but... <laughs> <laughs> and I have to think to myself, how did this happen? You know, I'm a council house boy from Hartlepool. How did I get to mix with these sort of people? I'm a Champions League mate as well, you know, Thierry Henry and Jamie Redknapp and Graham Souness, Glenn Hoddle. You know, how did that happen? Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been fortunate during the course of the years because I've been to some of the, you know, the great football grounds of the world, whether it be the New Camp or the Bernabeu, the San Siro, uh, the Allianz Arena, the uh, Olympic Stadium in, in Berlin, Victoria Park, Hartlepool. Been to them all. Uh, you know, and I've seen some great events. I was working out five Champions League finals and three Olympics and World Cup finals and uh, European Championships, World Athletics Championships. Uh, Wimbledon's, Grand Nationals, Derby's, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to go to them all and travel the world, whether it be Japan or the States, uh, Australia, Korea, and all at somebody else's expense. Uh, so if you bear with me a little while, for a little while, I'll tell you how, you know, after 42 years in the business, uh, I became an overnight success. Um, I, and I'd always wanted to be, somebody asked me outside, actually, um, when I realised I wanted to be a journalist. And I'd always wanted to be a journalist, you know, from when I was 12 years old. And I remember actually being called into my headmaster's study one morning, and this is something you didn't want to happen, because he was a sort of um, Dickensian type of character, you know, uh, tall, thin, cruel nose, thin lips, billowing black cloak, and it was usually bad news. And when I got there, he said, Stelling, he said, I understand that you want to be a journalist. He said, this is not a suitable profession for a boy from this school. 
Um, do you really want to snoop? Do you really want to be a peeping Tom? Do you really want to pry into people's lives in the hope of uncovering salacious tittle-tattle? Uh, and two things came to mind. is One, that he never read the Hartlepool Mail. <laughs> and two, that the job was even more appealing than I first thought. Um, and I knew I was good at this. And the reason I knew I was good at it was because I used to write to the local sports paper. And week after week after week, my letter was the star letter in the letters page. And it used to get me on five quid a week. It was fantastic. It wasn't until I got to the Hartlepool Mail that I found out it wasn't only the star letter. It was the only letter. <laughs> because the rest of the letters page was written by members of the sports staff you know, who would, would just fill some column inches. But nevertheless, yeah, that was what it inspired me. And I went up to the Hartlepool Mail. That was my first job. Um, and if any of you get a chance to go to the local newspapers, I recommend it thoroughly. It was great grounding. You know, we did local council meetings, county councils, magistrates' courts, uh, county courts, made contacts with police and fire brigade and so on and so forth. It's an absolutely brilliant grounding and one which I'd recommend. Now, when I've been there three or four years, I got the chance to go to local radio. Now, there were some recurring themes during the, the course of this talk. Uh, and the first thing was that I was lucky because local radio was in its sort of embryonic stage. You know, stations were popping up all over the country. You didn't need really to have any experience to get in there, just a desire. And, and so it was that I went to Radio Tees, which was my local radio station. And honestly, um, went into the newsroom, and, and it, was, it was an amazing newsroom in terms of the people who were there or who would arrive while I was there. There's a fellow called Mark Mardell, who went on to be the, uh, the Washington correspondent, I think might well still be, uh, uh, for, for the BBC. So you'll see him pop up on you know, the, the major news stories all the time. Uh, John Andrew went on to become home affairs correspondent for the BBC. Same thing. You always see it popping up on TV. We had um, Libby Forbert and David Stevenson, Kent Barker. may not mean much to you now, but they all went to work on the Today programme for Radio 4. So they were big successes. Ruth Pitt, who went on to become a, a, you know, a, an award-winning documentary maker. And at the other end of the scale, we had a bloke called Lee Peck, who went on to present uh, a show or co-host a show called Game for a Laugh, which was prime time Sunday evening on ITV and watched by about 12 million people every Sunday. You know, it, it was a fantastic place. Uh, my best, my old boss there as well, you know. So it was a great place to learn at. And um, again, a fantastic time. If you get a chance to go into local radio, it, it's a great thing to do. And it was while I was there, really, that there was a, a career-defining moment for me, I would guess. Uh, and it was the first weekend that I'd been at Radio T's, the very first weekend. Uh, I remember vividly, it was a Saturday morning, I was out playing football when my, my mum came running across the, the, the road towards the football ground that we were at and said, Jeff, it's, I've got a telegram for you. And a telegram sort of prehistoric email, okay? <laughs> and the, the, the telegram said, um, said uh, Bernard Gent football reporter taken ill, go immediately to Elland Road cover Leeds v Middlesbrough for sports show this afternoon. Which I thought was great. This is a fantastic opportunity. I think I'd been on the air once during the course of that first week. And here you know, I was, was going to be sent to what was in those days a really, really big football match. You know, it was top division. It was a local derby. It would be a sellout. This was a fantastic opportunity for me. Um, a couple of small drawbacks here was, was that, one, you know, I didn't have a car. So I wasn't too sure how to get there. But I rang my then girlfriend and, and said, she had a car. Uh, would you like an afternoon out shopping in Leeds? <laughs> well, it was truthful. You know, she was going to have an afternoon out shopping in Leeds, but I was going to be at the football match anyway. She took me there, which was great. But then some of the basic things, like, you know, they said to me, there'll be a ticket on the gate for you. Well, which gate? I mean, there are dozens of gates. How do you get into the ground in the first place? And once you're inside, how do you get your reports back? Because, you know, these days we've got things you know, called ISDN lines and you've got Skype and so on and so on. Didn't have it, then you had to have a telephone. And in the seat I was in, there was no telephone. Where do you get the telephone from? You know, the answer was within the press room and there was a pile, there was a cupboard with a pile of phones in there. Needed a lot of help from some of the senior journalists who were there, who thankfully, you know, all took pity on me. 
Um, and it went okay. Managed to get my reports back. That Saturday afternoon, I went to the office on the, the Monday, and suddenly I was the station sports reporter. And that was the first step along the path, really. You know, I'd always imagined that I was going to be a news journalist, but that was, your know, sport was a great love, great passion of mine. And, uh, and that, was the, that was the first step. And I absolutely loved it there. Um, but two or three years later, <coughs> I got a call from uh, a, a national radio station, which was LBC IRN, which was in a place called Gough Square. It's just off Fleet Street, you know, and every... Every budding journalist in, in those days wanted to work in Fleet Street. So this was, this was my chance. And they got a vacancy for a sports reporter. Uh, and they offered me the job. And I thought to myself, well, yeah, I love it here. We just bought a new house. It's a four-bedroom house overlooking the golf course. And it had a toilet upstairs and downstairs. And I thought, what more could anybody want? And I said, no, I don't think so. Don't want it. Thank you. Six months later, they rang again, and the guy who'd taken the job I decided it wasn't for him. Well, I thought to myself, you know, they're not going to come back a third time. So I decided that we would swap our four-bedroom detached house overlooking the golf course with an upstairs loo and a downstairs loo uh, for a one-bedroom flat in uh, the North End Road in West Kensington with a tin shower in the corner a TV that took 50, uh, 50 pence pieces, uh, riot police outside because it was the summer of some race riots in 1981, uh, and a punk rock band upstairs. Uh, and I hated it. I hated it with a vengeance. And in fairness, London hated me as well. I remember I'd been there a few weeks, and my boss got a letter about me saying, you know, for goodness sake, take that new reporter off the air. He said, we can't understand a word he is saying. <laughs> and my boss was very supportive, so he wrote back and said, you know, thanks for your letter. Uh, Jeff's from the northeast of England. I'm sure you would agree that regional accents in this day and age should be encouraged. Well, our correspondent was going to have the last word, and he wrote back again and said, uh, I agree regional accents should be encouraged in this day and age, but speech defects should not. <laughs> uh, it wasn't very welcoming. I, I hated it. I, mean, I hated it so much that I remember uh, applying for a job in Bristol. Anything, yeah, I just I was desperate to get out of London. Um, and I went down for the interview in, in, in Bristol. And arrogantly, I thought, I'm going to get this job, you know. I mean, I'm working for a national radio station. I want to go back to local radio. I'll get this job. Uh, but I didn't. And I rang the guy afterwards and said, why didn't I get the job? Uh, and uh, he was brutally honest. He said, well, to be truthful, Jeff, didn't like you very much. <laughs> you know. Hard to take, but it was, it, it was again, it was the truth. And I, I, I was lucky I didn't get the job in that sense because I, I stuck it out where I was and, and gradually got used to London. Uh, London gradually got used to me. My boss moved on. He went to BBC Radio, BBC National Radio, and he took me with him, which was great. I mean, I was in absolute, you know, a, a rarefied atmosphere in terms of sports broadcasting. I mean, these are names that may not mean much to you, but at the time, there were people like Brian Butler and Peter Jones. They were the doyens of football commentary. Uh, Desmond Lynham, who you know, was the best sports presenter in the business, no question about that. James Alexander Gordon, who read the football results. And I was, I was there working with them all. It was absolutely fantastic. And after two or three years, I presented lots of stuff, you know. I presented soccer specials in the evening and, and so on and so forth. But then the main job came up. It was their flagship sports program on Saturday afternoon. You know, national radio needed a new presenter. I thought that would suit me down to the ground. So I applied for it. And um, a couple of weeks later, I got a call from my, my then boss uh, asking me to come in and see her. And uh, she told me I hadn't got it, hadn't got the job. She'd got somebody better. Um, <laughs> and, and she might have been right, actually, because John Inverdale, who's a fantastic broadcaster, was the man who got the job. And I didn't. But at the time, I was a bit miffed, to say the least. So uh, I met a friend of mine, at a, 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 an acquaintance, really, at a press conference a few weeks after that. And uh, I'd known him through local radio. But now he was at, at TVAM, which was the forerunner at G GMTV. 
and he was the deputy sports editor. And he said to me that day, he said, ever thought about TV? Too difficult to get into, don't know how to get into it. He said, I'm the deputy sports editor. He said, if you want to come and work for us, I'll get you a job. And he did. And that was my first step into to TV. Um, and by the way, I hated it as well. It was a terrible place to work. Absolutely terrible. Um, boring as hell. It was the only journalistic job I've ever had that was boring. We used to go in um, for an overnight shift. It's obviously breakfast television. All the work's done during, during the night, or a lot of it. Um, and I, I would get there at 9 o'clock in the evening. I, and my sole job for a week of overnight shifts would be to write um, a two-minute sports bulletin. And I had 12 out, well, 10 hours to do it till the following morning. Two-minute sports bulletin. The big question was whether you did it in the first hour between 9 and 10, or you wait till 5, to, uh, five or 6 o'clock in the morning. It was terrible. And they gave no prominence to sport whatsoever. I mean, our only sports programme went out at 6 a.m. on a Saturday morning, so you can imagine just how many people would watch that. Um, it, it was, a, it was a, a, a shocking place to work. I was absolutely desperate to get out of it. Um, it's not a great recommendation, is it, so far? <laughs> how many places have I hated or been desperate to get out of? But it was, a, we, look, we were poor seconds to roll and rat at the time, so <laughs> you had to get away from there. Um, and I did. I, I got away by going to... Um, uh, satellite television, which again was, was a coming thing. Obviously, there was Sky on one hand, you know, with the great god Rupert Murdoch, uh, and there was British satellite broadcasting on the other hand, who were the squareal people. Uh, and I got the chance of a job uh, at British satellite broadcasting. And I wanted to be a, a presenter, and I wanted to be a presenter on the sports news channel. So again, I applied. Um, the guy who interviewed me was head of sports news then, was a bloke called Vic Wakeling. Um, and I didn't get the job. There were three jobs going, didn't get one of them. But he decided that he would offer me a reporter's job. Not really what I wanted, but look, it's a foot in the door, so I'll take the reporter's job, that's fine. A month later, he rang me again and said, Jeff, he said, been looking through your show reel. He said, to be honest, he said, you are going to be wasted being a reporter. He said, you should be in front of the camera being a presenter. So I said to him, who's quit? And he said, well... <laughs> He said, there's a guy called Steve Smith who was going to be one of our, our three main presenters who's decided he wants to stay in Wales and not come. Um, he said, so that's why you've got the job. Said, that was fine by me. But he also said that um, his two other sports news presenters were um, Gary Richardson, who still does a great job on, on BBC Radio now, uh, and Anna Walker, who went on to present um, you know, travel shows on ITV and, and, and such like. He said... They are going to be our stars. They are, I remember the phrase, he said, they're sprinkled with stardust. He said, they'll get all the main shows, they'll get all the, the glamorous occasions and the such like. And you, you'll be our workhorse. You'll be the guy who's doing the late night stuff and, and so on and so forth. Didn't mind, it was presenting. Um, and I got my foot in the door through that. Um, and, and that's a phrase that keeps on coming up, you know, foot in the door. But I was with the Square Real people, one side. Rupert Murdoch, the other side, found very quickly in life it doesn't pay to take on Rupert Murdoch. Just doesn't. And a couple of years later, we were all made redundant, um, which was, you know, I mean, quite a tough time. But I had a friend in the Northeast who said, um, we work for Tyne Tees. And he uh, said, well, we've got a, a new show coming up. He said, it's a 15-minute opt-out every night from their Middlesbrough studios. And did I want to come and present it? Yes, thanks, I did. So for a, a couple of weeks, I was commuting from London to Teesside, which is the wrong way around, you know, because you're paying London prices for your house or your rent, or, you know, and your food and so on and so forth, and you're earning a Teesside salary. It's not the way to do it. But two weeks induction, that was fantastic. And on the, uh, after the two weeks, on the Sunday night, I remember I was ready to present the first 15-minute opt-out from Middlesbrough the next day. And my phone went. It was 7 o'clock on a, a Sunday evening. <coughs> and it was the guy, Mike Miller, who got me the job at TVAM before. He's, he's now commissioning editor for Channel 4 Sport. And he said, um, what do you know about American football? I said, not a great deal. Translated means... 
absolutely nothing. Uh, so how quickly could you learn? Pretty quickly. He said, we've just got the rights to um, the first ever World League of American Football. We've got a 13-week series coming up. He said, the producer and the director are coming over from the States. They'll be here on Tuesday. Presentation job is yours if you want it, but you have to be here at that meeting on Tuesday. 13 weeks at Channel 4 doing the World League of American Football, paid more than a year at Time Tees did. So there was no real decision to be made. Next morning, I was on the train back to London, trying to explain to my mate who got me the job at Time Tees why I wouldn't be presenting from Middlesbrough that day or indeed any other day. Um, so I was back in London doing something different, and, and something I knew nothing about, but it taught me a good lesson because for the next couple of weeks, I immersed myself in every single American football video that I could so that I knew the terminology and, and I knew the positions and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, it, it taught me the value of, of research, that is for sure. And that eventually came to an end, so I became a sort of bona fide freelancer, if you like. I went off and did a lot of stuff for the BBC, and I went over to work for Eurosport, which was based in Paris at the time. And, and you know, it, it was a, a shambolic place, a lot of fun in many senses. Um, you did a bit of everything. I went off there and I did uh, football commentary, athletics commentary, um, tennis, all, all sorts of things. Um, but it, it was run um, by, by a, a French head of programming who really didn't understand the ins and outs of it. So, you know, for instance, 7 o'clock in the evening, I might be doing you know, tennis live from Rome. This is Jeff Stelling, tennis live from Rome. The next program, 8 o'clock, would be me commentating on athletics live from Chicago. You know, I mean, it <laughs> didn't make any sense. But you, you, you did a bit of everything until one weekend when I was the last Englishman in the studio. It was a great multinational mix. It was a great experience. Um, and, and the guy who was the director of the program came over to me and, and said, Jeff, he said, w what do you know about fencing? <laughs> well, I said, I know a bit about creosoting, but that, that's about all. Uh, and he said, well, he said, we've got a fencing program in half an hour's time. And he said, you're presenting it. Oh, I said, no, 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 no. I, can't, I, can't, I know nothing about fencing, nothing whatsoever. Uh, and he said, no, you are, you're the last Englishman here, you are presenting it. And he said, let me put it this way, if you don't present this program, he said, you won't be back in the office again tomorrow or on any other occasion. So I presented an hour of fencing, which consisted mainly of things like, well, <clears throat> the crowd appreciated that. <laughs> or, goodness me, my word, what a move. Uh, and, and reading the score, which would appear off the caption at the bottom. This, these are the World Fencing Championship semi-finals, for goodness sake. Didn't get any complaints. And I think that was bonkers, by the way. Um, there was another guy who worked there called Angus Loughran, who you might know as Stato. Um, he used to be there at, at the same time as me. They did the same thing to him, but it was with ice hockey. And he'll tell you this story is absolutely true. Uh, it was one of the biggest ice hockey matches you can ever remember, ever think of. It was the USSR, as it was then, uh, ag against uh, the USA. Uh, and, and Stato was told at short notice that he would be commentating on it. Uh, one of the big issues was, there was no team sheets, no names, nothing at all. I mean, nothing about ice hockey anyway. So he coped the only way he could. And he thought of the only uh, Russian names and American names that he could come up with. So his ice hockey commentary went something on the lines of, uh, off we go, and it's uh, Gorbachev straight off to Stalin, uh, and now Lenin, Lenin on the cruise job, Lyndon Johnson intercepts there! <laughs> and he used names purely of Russian and American leaders. Number of complaints? None. <laughs> Which I think told you something about how many people were actually watching Eurosport at the time. Um, but but I, I got the idea that, you know, I had to get away. Uh, and the opportunity to get away came uh, late one afternoon when I got a call from Sky Sports, uh, well, Sky News Sport as it was then. And, and they, they really hadn't been helpful to me in the past. I'd tried to get in there on a number of occasions uh, and again, couldn't get that foot in the door. So Andy Cairns was the guy's name and he rang me when I was in Paris uh, at one early evening and said, do you want a shift presenting the sports bulletins on Sky News. And I said, yes, please, I definitely want that shift. And he said, okay. He said, be at Sky at 4.30 tomorrow morning. And I was in Paris. Um, I said, fine, I'll be there. 
Got the last flight out of Paris that night, back to London. I, I didn't even know where Sky was, to be absolutely honest at the time, but found the studios, eventually got inside. Um, and it was a one-man band operation by then. I, in those days, you, you, you're there at your desk at five o'clock in the morning. You have to write pieces, edit pieces, uh, edit film, you know, go to makeup, get yourself dressed, do the lot. So it, it was a real baptism of fire. I remember going to the studio. The first bulletin was 6.20 in the morning, and there was the great Bob Friend, who was one of the <coughs> best broadcasters and, and best guys you'd ever meet, um, who, who was one of the hosts. And a little Miss Mischievous called Penny Smith, who used to be there as well. And, and Penny's idea of fun, by the way, was while you were reading your sports bulletin, she would put her hand on your thigh under the desk and stroke your thigh up and down in the hope that you would crack up live on air. She did it absolutely all the time. She was an absolute minx. But I was there. <laughs> I'd done a shift, and, and I was in, and, you know, I was, I was through the door. Um, I, I did a lot of freelance work there, and then eventually there was a guy called Matt Lorenzo who left to go to ITV, and they rang me off for me his job, and, and that was great. Um, I, and eventually I went on to do more and more sport for the, the main sports channels. Uh, just as I do Soccer Saturday now, I co-presented the, uh, the forerunner of that, which was a, a show called Sports Saturday. And, and just as Soccer Saturday is a football show with no football, so Sports Saturday was a sports show with no sport, none at all. Uh, we had no rights to anything. So we would have things, um, you know, like, well, we, I remember one day we had a, a group of synchronized swimmers come in and do their routine in the studio. I mean, no water, of course. <laughs> uh, that was our, our idea of a, a sports show. Near Christmas, I remember, we used to, uh, I don't know how we got away with this, but we used to promote the toys, the new toys that were on sale at Harrods. Uh, and I remember one Christmas in particular, we had Alan Lamb, the former England cricketer, throwing balls at my head as I tried to catch them on my Velcro skull cap. <laughs> And I think it was at that stage, I thought, my career's not necessarily going the way I want it to. But again, I persevered. And, and from Sports Saturday came along the idea, ultimately, of Soccer Saturday. Uh, and it was my old boss, Vic Wakeling, who decided that probably wasn't good enough to present their sports bulletins at the British Satellite Broadcasting, he was now in charge at, at Sky Sports. And he said to me, look, Sports Saturday, we want to turn it into a football programme. Four and a half hours initially it was going to be. He said, do you think we could maintain chat about football and scores for four and a half hours? Nothing else, no other sports. I said, depends. I said, you, you really need somebody who is going to be absolutely immersed in the sport. You know, who's going to get his head stuck in the statistics, who will know the game inside out, who can keep the thing going, you know, and such like. And he said, any idea who that might be? And I said, there's only one person for this job, Vic. What I meant was there was only one person daft enough or desperate enough. Uh, and that was me. And, and consequently, um, that was how I got to do uh, Soccer Saturday. And that was, what, 20 years ago now. Um, uh, you know, and it's, it's been a fantastic... Nobody believed that it would work. But it has, and, and realistically, while there's football at 3 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, there's no reason why it, it shouldn't go on working. And I've got, you know, the world's icing on the cake. I've got a chance to do Champions League. I mean, I even got a chance to do Countdown for three years, just down the road from here for the first year, working in Leeds, you know. And again, there was an element of good fortune in that because the head of Channel 4, the head of Channel 4 afternoon programming, was a lady called Helen Warner, who's a fan fantastic woman. But she didn't want me. She, she, I mean, she didn't have a clue who I was for a start. She's not a football fan. Um, but the Countdown producer, uh, who's a great character, is a guy called uh, Damien Eady. He lives in Leeds, in actual fact. You know, and, and, and if you've never met a Countdown producer before, you've probably got a vision in your head of you know, a sort of elderly bookworm or something like that. And Damien Eady is a leather jacketed, uh, the least politically correct person I've ever met in my life. Um, you know, who's also a big football fan, Blackpool fan. And he wanted me, okay? But Helen Warner wanted, uh, I'm not telling you any secrets or anything, Helen Warner wanted Alexander Armstrong. So that was fine. Um, and Alexander Armstrong was, uh, went along for a, a screen test. Um, and 
<laughs> he alienated people because the, as soon as the, the, the signature tune ran, at the end of it, when it you know, goes, the, you know, do -do 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 -do. first thing Alexander Armstrong said, well, that's got to go. So we're not having that tune. So it needs to be something much more modern. Now that was, uh, you know, that was like the man who shot Bambi, really, you know. Um, he, he'd alienated the production staff and he'd alienated Damien he'd alienated Helen Warner as well. So the following week, after a weekend with Damien uh, and with Rachel O'Reilly, you know, looking at everything that could possibly come up, I did a screen test on the Monday morning and got the job on the Monday afternoon. So again, it was, it was the icing on the cake. It was three years of, of, of fun, really. Um, so what I'm trying to tell you, I guess, in a long-winded way, is that nothing's impossible. You know, if it can happen to me, you know, it can happen to you. Absolutely, you've always got to chase your dreams. Nothing is impossible, no matter what people tell you. There are a lot of things I think you need. You need a lot of luck, you know, you need a lot of luck. I mean, I was lucky that local radio was growing when I was a, a, a teenager. I was lucky that our Middlesbrough football reporter was taken ill on my first weekend in the job. I was lucky that LBC IRN came back to me a second time and offered me a job, having turned it down the first time. I was lucky that Vic Wakeling eventually gave me a, a job presenting on British Satellite Broadcasting because somebody had pulled out. I was lucky that he didn't want to come for that job. I was lucky as well you know, that I got the opportunity to present Soccer Saturday, a brand new program. Um, uh, the thing about luck is, when it comes along, you've got to grab it with both hands and run with it. You know, um, I knew, for example, that uh, I was taking a step into the dark by going to local radio. But I was determined to take that step. I knew LBC weren't going to offer me the job for a third time. I had to go when they offered me it. I knew I had to be on that flight back from Paris to get that presenting job at Sky, you know? I, I knew I would make, or I could make, Soccer Saturday a, a program of my own, you know? But I had to fling myself into that body and soul. A lot of that, by the way, was in, in the way of preparation. You know, there were stories that I used to go to Winchester Services um, on the M3 and, and, and do my prep there, and I did, because my kids then were like three and four years old, and they didn't understand that Dad needed some peace and quiet. So that was the only place I could get some peace and quiet. And it, yeah, it, it means that, for instance, I mean, now I can tell you, you know, because of preparation, you know, that um, a Bournemouth have lost every game this season when they've conceded the first goal. Um, Manchester United haven't lost a home league game uh, when they've been in front at half time since 1984 when uh, Ipswich Town beat them. Uh, Leeds' only away loss this season has been at, at, at Middlesbrough. All of Brighton's nine wins in the championship this season have been by one goal. And the Hartlepool midfielder, Nicky Featherstone, has scored once in his last 209 appearances. <laughs> you know, so um, it's a sad life in some ways, believe you me, you know. When you come up with something like that, you go, once in 209, fantastic! You know, you're just waiting for that next goal. Um, but, you, you know, you can never, ever, ever over-prepare. That's one thing I've found in life, and it doesn't matter, you know, what aspect of broadcasting, really what aspect of life you're involved in. You can never over-prepare. I mean, 99% of the stats I do on Saturdays, you know, and spend hours and hours and hours preparing them, they'll never see the light of day. But, you know, that one moment, you know... When Nicky Featherstone scores his second goal in 210 games, I'll be punching the air just as much as he will be, you know, because I've religiously jotted that down every week. So prepare, prepare, prepare. And keep believing in yourself. I think that's the other thing, is keep believing in yourself. And I look back at the people who didn't necessarily believe in me, you know, my headmaster. <laughs> didn't believe in me, didn't think I could become a journalist, didn't want to be, me to become a journalist. The letter writer at LBC in London. Couldn't wait to see the the back of me. The head of BBC Radio Sport didn't think I was the bloke to present their sports show. Vic Wakeling didn't think I was the bloke to be presenting uh, on British satellite broadcasting. Um, head of Channel 4's afternoon programming didn't really want me. Wanted Alexander Armstrong in instead. You will meet people, it's an absolute inevitability, who will reject you. You meet rejection all the time. And, and sometimes it's difficult, but you have to keep believing. You have to keep 
the faith. You know, keep thinking you can do this job. Um, and and uh, don't be discouraged because eventually you will meet people who share that belief in you. And, and by the way, it's not easy. Um, you know, there aren't any big newsrooms in local radio anymore. You know, there aren't any big newsrooms in, in local newspapers. But of course, the, you know, the digital era means there are lots of other opportunities now. I, I mean, I go to Sky, and there are so many people who work on, you know, Sky.com, SkySports.com, um, you know, keeping the Twitter feed up to date, keeping the Facebook site up to date. There are still plenty of opportunities out there. They're just different opportunities, really, from when I was a, a, a kid. I, I, I look a bit laterally as well if you're looking for a, a job in, in the media. When I finished here, I'm going off to do some work for um, Prostate Cancer UK. Well, they've got a huge media department, as do most charities now. Most football clubs have got big media departments. You know, there, are, there are lots of ways to get into the business. Uh, and again, getting that foot in the door is the hardest thing. And again, obviously I relate to sport. And not all of you might be into sport. You, you, know, you might not feel that's where your ambitions lie. Um, but it was for me. And, and also I was a big football fan. All the TV stations, obviously Sky in particular, have got huge football departments, but it's the department that everybody wants to be in. You know, so my advice would be, you know, do something different, find a niche. And it doesn't just apply to sport, but I mean, before I did football, you know, I'd done snooker and greyhound racing, pool, horse racing, boxing, athletics, fencing, um, you know, uh, basketball, uh, obviously reporting, not playing. <laughs> Five foot seven and a quarter. Bob average height for a man, I'm sure you all know that, in Guatemala. Um, I, I, did, I did sumo wrestling, and again, reporting, okay, not, not playing. You know, find a niche, try and become an expert in something a bit different, maybe a fringe sport. I was thinking about this, you know, for example, just to get an opportunity, things like women's sport at the moment, you know, which are, coming phenomenon, if you like, you know, women's football, women's cricket, women's rugby. And yes, there are people out there covering it, but it's not as saturated as, as you know, some of the, the more mainstream sports at the moment. And again, if you can make yourself an expert in, in, in something just a little bit different, then you've got a chance. It's not just sport. Actually, I can think of an example of somebody who, who, who did something in a, an, another sphere. Uh, and this guy was um, what the BBC used to call a tech op, and he's a, you know, he's a button pusher, basically, at the BBC, and he wanted to change his life. And he thought he wanted to broadcast, but he wasn't quite sure what. So he immersed himself um, in airlines, in schedules, in travel companies, in consumer rights, in holiday destinations. Uh, and his name is Simon Calder. And he's now you know, the foremost travel expert in terms of the media in this country. He works for the Independent. You'll see him all the time on TV. If anybody wants an opinion on anything travel related, then he is the man that they go to. He's their go-to man. Uh, and he did that by finding himself a niche, by doing the work, by doing the preparation. Um, and he's been a, a fantastic success. You've also got to be prepared to work long hours and be paid an absolute pittance, which you will be at first. You've got to be prepared to make the tea. You've always got to be willing. Um, uh, there's a, a guy who used to work at Sky News called Gary Hughes, and he started coming in as a 15-year-old doing just those sort of things. He was, you know, he was a runner. He came in for nothing, he, you know. And if somebody said you'd go and take this script to so and so, you know, go and get the tea, go and park that car, whatever. Well, he wouldn't park the car at 15, uh, but everything else he would do. Um, and now he's head of Sky Sports Football, and you know, he's gone from coming in on a voluntary basis getting the tea and doing the running, to be one of the real big cheeses there, you know. And he's only he's in his early 30s. He's not a dinosaur by any means. But again, it just shows you what can be done. It can happen. Uh, it, it won't happen to everybody here. Some people will find it, it's too hard, you know. Or, or they find different interests. Um, but what I would say is it, it, it's not the soft option that some people think it is. I mean, when I was at uh, Sky News Sports, I used to have to be there at 4.30 in the morning. Now, you know, I work every single weekend. You know, I'll often be in the studios till 11 o'clock at night. You know, I'll be away from home a hell of a lot. 
um, you know, you'd be away from your wife and your kids and your family and things. I mean, junior doctors do not know how easy they got it, to be brutally honest. Um, you know, we, we, we don't get any extra pay for that, by the way. Um, you, you know, you'll work boxing days, you'll work every bank holiday. Uh, so, so it is tough. Um, but, but persevere if you possibly can. And don't, by the way, if you get your foot in that door, don't give anybody the opportunity to push it out. I mean, I've done Soccer Saturday for 20 years now. I've missed one show, one show in 20 years, and that was because my second son was being born. Because I don't, you know, I don't want to give anybody else the opportunity to sit in that seat and do it as well or better than me. You know, my son's a, my son's a goalkeeper, 15-year-old son's a goalkeeper, and he broke his nose about three weeks ago. And he was told he shouldn't play for six weeks. But they've got a substitute goalkeeper, reserve goalkeeper, sitting on the, on the, on the bench there. So... I think it was four days after he'd broken his nose. He played that Sunday because he didn't want to give the kid who was sitting on the bench a chance to get in his place. And that's a, you know, if you got the opportunity, you know, if you ever get a pres presenting job, reporting job, or whatever, make, make sure nobody snatches that opportunity away from you. And that's why I come hell or high water, come illness, whatever, I make sure that 12 o'clock Saturday afternoon, I am sitting in that chair. Uh, ill, hungover, whatever, I'm going to be there. Um, I tell you, uh, those of you who do persevere, you know, whether you want to be a, a written journalist, whether you want to be a broadcaster, whether you're going to head off to work in new, evolving media outlets, this is the best job in the world. The best career in the world. You know, uh, Somebody asked me outside, what makes it different? And it's because every day is different. You turn up at your newspaper office or your TV station or whatever, you don't know what's going to happen that day. No idea what's going to happen that day. You have no idea how long you're going to be there for. Um, every single day is different. I'm not kidding you, not every single day is exciting, but every single day is different. You know, it's not nine or five. You know, if you want a nine or five job, you're in absolutely the wrong place, but it is the best job in the world. Uh, so my advice would be, please persevere, and hopefully, in a few years' time, one of you will be standing here delivering this talk rather than me. And it'll get my best off my back as well. Uh, <laughs> look, thanks for, being, thanks for coming at 9.30 on a Monday morning. Uh, thanks for being a, a fantastic audience, and I'm very happy. If anybody's got any questions to ask, and as you want to be journalists, I'll be disappointed if you haven't, okay? If anybody's got any questions to ask, just fire away. Yeah, hi. What's it like working with, like, top footballers, day day Right, so you're not talking about Chris Kamara there. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it, look, it's fantastic. They're, they are... I think what, the way you've got to approach it is, they were great footballers. Doesn't mean they're great broadcasters. You know, in, in, in my field, you know, if I'm, if I'm sitting working with, you know, Phil Thompson or Thierry Henry or whatever, I'm the professional, you know, I'm the expert in this, you know, and they're not. I mean, they'd look a hell of a lot better than me on a football field, um, but within the studio, you know, I'm the guy who's in control. So that, that's the way I look at it, really. You know, it's easy when you see a, a big, glossy, glamorous name come in to be you're slightly overawed by it. But I always look upon myself as an equal. Uh, and thankfully, they do to me as well. Like Phil Thompson said to me, you know, before he came in to, to do Soccer Saturday, he didn't believe that anybody who hadn't played the game at the highest level could possibly have an opinion worth listening to. Actually, that's still his view now, but uh, no, <laughs> you know, only started to do the show. So I, I think, you know, you're in your, your comfort zone, you're in your field of expertise, you, you know, don't be overawed by them, that's, that's the big thing. Still, it's still great, I mean, it's still, you know, the first time you meet Thierry Henry, it's still a, a great feeling. Uh, yes, right back, yeah. Um, favourite sport to cover was, um, well, there's lots of sports that I, I loved. Um, I loved doing horse racing, um, partly because, 
uh, at the time, we, we used to have a, during the summer months, we used to have a racing show every night, every single night. We always did it from the course. So I got to travel around the country, you know, a, a huge amount. Um, and, it, and also it was something a bit different, you know. Um, there weren't that many people out there doing horse racing, and I, and I thought this is something where I could find a little niche. Um, you know, it was, um, yeah, they, they were a good, good few years. Although it's a difficult sport to cover. Um, I think horse racing commentary is probably the most difficult thing, difficult sport to commentate on full stop. It's okay. Tennis is fine, you know. You've got two players, one at either end. In horse racing, you might have 20 horses, and they all look brown to me, you know? <laughs> I, I'm not sure how you describe that. Um, I had an interesting, by the way, um, yeah, I loved horse racing. An interesting incident happened during the course of um, my horse racing broadcast. You do get letters, and you know, they're not all complimentary. And um, I, I got a letter one about uh, my horse racing presenting one day, and it, it basically said, um, Dear Jeff, we'd like to wipe that smug, sickly smile off your face with the toe of our boots. Fine. Um, so I had this little habit. I mean, it's a naughty thing to do. So I'm pretty non-PC. And um, so I read the letter out, uh, you know, from this individual. So I'd like to wipe that smug, sickly smile off your face with the toe of my boots. But I also read out his name and address, um, which I thought was, you know, just to embarrass him a little bit. Um, and and he, he actually came from uh, Musselburgh, which has got a, a race course of its own in Scotland. Um, and the next time we were at Musselburgh, a couple of very large Scottish guys headed towards me as I started to rehearse to present the show. And, you know, both shaven headed in Kansas Special Brew in hand. And, oh, God. <laughs> Please don't let one of these guys be the one who wipe, wants to wipe that sickly, smug smile off my face with the toe of his boot. Uh, there was nothing I could do, you know. We were rehearsing for the show, and they got there, and the first guy said, Jeff. And I said, yeah. He said, uh, that guy who wanted to wipe that smug, sickly smile off your face with the toe of his boot. I said, yeah. He said, he won't be bothering you again. <laughs> <laughs> I destroyed the letter as incriminating evidence, potentially, you know. Anyway. Uh, yes, any more? Yeah. Oh, pleasure. Um, you know Julian Warren? Yeah. Advice yeah. What advice do you give him? Like, you just I don't. Do no, don't give him any, any advice. Um, he, uh, you know, when he first started to do it, I mean, I gave him advice about things like preparation uh, and such like, but he, he's got his own way of, of, of doing the show, you know? Um, uh, and it's different to mine. He doesn't use as, as many statistics. He just does it his own way. Um, which I think is the right thing to do. He wants to, to stamp his own personality on the shows that he does. You know, there's no point in copying, is there? You, I mean, there's no point in trying to be somebody that you're not. You know, so he does it differently, really professionally. Um, you know, and curiously enough, I, I, I say I don't want anybody else to get in, in my seat, and that's why I'm, I'm never ill. And there's such a, there aren't many people, actually, at Sky who want to take on the challenge of doing Sort of Saturday. You know, um, I mean, it's, it's the individual most popular program that they've got. But people think that it is too challenging. And Julian was one of the ones, you know, who, who didn't think that way. He wanted to do it. He wanted to give it a go. And, and I think he does a, you know, I think he does a great job. And, I, you know, I think when I retire in a year or two or whatever it is, you know, then, then he should be the one that takes the job if he wants it. Yeah, hi. Um, well, if you'd asked me a few years ago, I'd have said no, but if you ask me now, I don't see why not. Um, you know, there are women in, more and more women in just about every form of sports broadcast. If you look at Sky, uh, Sky Sports News, obviously, you know, 50% of our presenters are women. Um, and, and there's no, you know, there are no sort of defining lines saying, you know, Hayley McQueen, you, you can't present this part of the show because it's football, you know, you'll do that. There's, there's n you, nothing, Jim White, you do it. There's nothing like that. Um, you know, so there's, there's, there's no sort of sexual discrimination in, 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 in that sense. And, and over the years, you know, look, I, I, I used to know years ago, I knew Helen Rollison very, 
very well, who was really one of the first women to make a, a breakthrough in terms of sports broadcasting, and she found it difficult, you know? She found that it was a male-dominated society, and, 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 and people took that view, that you know, they didn't have the credibility or the experience you know, to, uh, to broadcast on, on sports that they hadn't played. But it's back to the Phil Thompson argument, in a way, you know? I, I, mean, I never played football at a high level. I don't think that rules me out. Uh, having an opinion about it, you know, and I don't think my opinion about football would be any more valid than your opinion about football, for example. So you know, there's no reason why not. And, and I think more and more mainstream media is coming to the same, the same view. Yeah, hi. Do you have one as well? Oh, no, the same one. I was trying to get All right. No, no problem. Yeah, hi. Right at the back. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the almighty Ruth Murdoch. Yeah. Well, he, phew, well, he's only got, you know, he, he doesn't sort of own Sky anymore, which is, is, is one thing. You, you never, we, we never really saw Rupert Murdoch around the building, you know. Um, he had sort of trusted lieutenants, uh, and you dealt with them. Uh, you know, obviously, as, over the years, there have been many battles that Rupert Murdoch and Sky have been involved in, whether legal battles, you know, battles against competitors and such like. And generally speaking, 99% of the time, Rupert Murdoch wins, you know. So like him or loathe him, I'd rather be on his side than be on the other side. I've been on the other side, you know. Um, so, but, but I don't know him personally at all. Yeah, hi. What's your favorite well, so many of them. Uh, so, well, the fav I mean, most people's favourite is when he was at, at Portsmouth, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I crossed live and said, uh, so there's been a red card in the uh, game down at Fratton Park. Let's hear about it. Chris Kamara. <laughs> I said, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Chris, uh, you know, use your fingers. Kind of how many Portsmouth players are still on? And uh, you know, my information is that there's been a red card. No, I haven't seen anything. <laughs> says, Chris, my sources tell me that Portsmouth fans Anthony Van den Boer has been sent off. Oh, I, I saw him go off, but I thought he'd been substituted. <laughs> was, was cutting edge reporting. The, the, the best thing about that was that look, Cammy loves the camera. He, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. He's made a great career for himself. You know. I was joking about the, the Swindon Town stuff, but you know, <coughs> most of the other guys that you'll see on any TV show you know, have, have got medals galore, trophies galore, international caps galore, and Cammy hasn't. Uh, and it, it's all the more you know, um, meritorious that he's done what he's done without that sort of background. But after the Anthony Van den Boer moment, I mean, you know, that was a moment. It went viral. You know, it was absolutely everywhere. And the following day, um, Australian TV ran Cammy up and said, would you do a little chat about it? Cammy, again, loves the media, so absolutely delighted to. Uh, so he, he spoke to Australian TV about it. What he didn't realise was that as it was going out, they had a shot of Chris Kamara on screen and a caption that read, is this the world's worst football reporter? <laughs> Underneath. <laughs> They've never heard of Dean Windass, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I... Uh, yeah. 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 It, 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 it's um. Well, they, they say competition sharpens you up, don't they? And um, that that's certainly been the case. You know, as far as BT are concerned, that I mean, over the years there have been other um, other competitors. I mean, other competitors to, I mean, initially to our show, you know, um, ITV used to have a, uh, a similar sort of results show um, called uh, The Goal Rush. Uh, and Brian Barwick went on to become, you know, he was head of ITV then, went on to become uh, head of uh, the Football League and so on and so forth. I remember bumping into him one day uh, and they'd scrapped The Goal Rush after two or three seasons. Uh, and he said, there was no point. He said, we'd go to football grounds, and all we would ever see is your show. He said, I'd walk down the high street and pass Curry's, and all we'd ever see on TV is your show. You know, so 
we've seen off competitors before, but BT, um, yeah, I mean, everybody at Sky respects what they do. You know, they've got a huge chunk of football now. You know, uh, obviously they've got some, some Premier League. Uh, all the Champions League, uh, Europa League as well. So they, they are a, a major rival, there's no question. Everybody at Sky understands that. Um, and it was inconsequent when the last Premier League bid came round. You know, I tell you what, if you work for the Premier League, you're in dreamland. So because, you know, you've got Sky there, you've got BT there, you've got a few other companies around the fringes that, as well. You're in dreamland because you know that the price for your product is going to go sky high. And in, in the case of the Premier League, Sky knew, knew that they could not afford to lose the Premier League. So our bid was such that, you know, there was no way BT would beat it. And, it, and it, 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 you know, I'm, I'm sure Sky won't mind me saying, you know, it has consequences. <coughs> you, you know, there, there are lots of um, things at Sky at the moment that are being streamlined to make way for the Premier League because it costs so much. So, um, yeah, they are major players, BT, no question about that. Um, and wh whether they ever want to do a, a, a Soccer Saturday style program, I don't know. They, they try and do a similar thing with, with the Champions League, um, you know, whereby they've got a panel looking at the games coming in. I, I don't think that works personally. I, I, you know, um, I, I don't think it works simply because all of those games are available on BT. So why, why would you want to watch people talking about eight matches, which is, most of which don't involve, I'm very parochial, most of which don't involve British clubs. So, so I don't think that really works. Um, I don't know they've got any plans for a, a Saturday afternoon show, um, but they are, yeah, respected rival. Yeah, hiya. You've had a great career as a sports journalist, but do you have any regrets? Uh, do I have any regrets? No, no, I don't, I don't have any regrets at all, really. I mean, you know, when, you, when, you've had, you know, when you've had the life that I've had, you can't have any regrets because it's all gone you know, so fantastically well. Um, you know, there, there, there are moments, I mean, I, there, there was an incident uh, a few years ago involving Sam Allardyce, and um, bungs in football were very topical at the time, uh, very topical. And there was going to be a panorama documentary about uh, people taking bungs in football, and Sam's name had been linked with it. I mean, all sorts of names were linked with it, but Sam's was. And there had been a match down at Fratton Park, uh, he was, he was tells you how long ago, he was Bolton Wanderers manager. And, and afterwards, we had a, they, they'd won the game. We had a live um, link with Sam. And uh, I said to Sam, you know, about third question in, Sam, have you, have you ever, been, ever been offered a bung? And uh, he wasn't best pleased to be asked. And his chairman was even less well pleased to be asked. And, and the media went crazy, you know. Um, um, Phil Gartside, the Bolton chairman, rang my boss at you know, 11 o'clock at night. Uh, my boss rang me and then sort of tore my head off. And um, there, was a, a, there were a couple of weeks where I, I was clinging on to my job. Um, but my regret about that wasn't that I had to ask the question, because I'm, Sam, Sam didn't really listen to it at the time. And I get on fine with Sam now. S Sam heard in his own mind a question which said, have you ever taken a bung? where I'd asked, have you ever been offered a bone, which is a completely different thing. But the regret I have was that the producer of the show that night, six months later, was out of the door at Sky. I always wonder whether that had any sort of influence over that decision, because he was, he was a good guy, and, um, and he had no control over the questions I asked, you know? Because um, that was the only slight regret. Look, I have a fantastic career. No, no regrets at all. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, what's your favourite moment in uh, your favourite experience in journalism? Oh, craggy. It's been 40 years of this, so, you know. Um, it, 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 well, maybe my favourite moment was uh, the first time in a local newspaper when, you know, I'd written the front page lead, you know, and you see your name in the byline there. You know, the, the, there's, there's nothing quite like that. You know, you can never repeat it. It only happens once. Um, so, yeah, I think that was, and, and also at the time, that was my ambition, was to be a written journalist, you know, written news journalist. So that was a big step along the way. That would probably be it, yeah. Hiya. Um, when problems were in a different situation, you've had a huge step. How do you try to um, cope with this so you can do your job to the best of your ability? 
Well, again, I mean, it depends, you know, that the, there aren't, in, in sport, you know, you're prepared for most things. I mean, thrown into different situations, there's a, uh, you know, an example of that would be um, what's happened in Paris over the weekend. Um, and, and people there, I, I don't know, you, you, you click into sort of professional mode. I remember one of the few things that, um, enjoy is not the right word, but one of the few satisfying things when I was at TVAM was, that it was an air crash. Um, I mean, it was a, yeah, it was a terrible, terrible occasion. It was yeah, a keg with air, air crash. And um, I was working on sport, but suddenly it was all hands to the pump working on this massive news story. Um, and I hadn't done news for quite a number of years. But, you know, that grounding, that training, you know, that professionalism, it j just clicks in, you know, you know what's required, you know. Uh, if you've got a good grounding in, in, in journalism, whether it be here or local newspaper or whatever, you know what the top line is. You, you, you just do. You don't, it's like riding a bike. You don't forget. You know, you can still pick out that top line. And I think, I think that's what happens, you know. I mean, we watch, I was talking to Mike beforehand, you, you watch the events unfolding in, in, in Paris over the weekend. And as a journalist or a broadcaster, you can't help but watch the performance of those who are, who are broadcasting at the time. You know, and how Jeremy Thompson turns up, you know, at 9 o'clock on a, a, a Saturday morning, you know, seemingly with no notes, you know, just an earpiece, and performs with authority and clarity, you know, and he's still there doing it at 9 o'clock at night, you know. It, it, it's just, it's the journalist or the broadcaster just, in you just takes over. Any more? Yeah, hi, mate. Well, there have been, been lots of them. I mean, one of them was when um, uh, Manchester City won the you know, Premier League title in what it was, what, 94th, 95th minute? Oh, yeah. Uh, and Paul Merson was at, at his best, you know. City players are piling on top of each other. Oh, they're giving each other love bites and everything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, that was the game that Joey Barton was sent off in, and as he was sent off, he tried to head but somebody else, and, and Merce said during the course that, he, he said, it's like platoon out there, you know, <laughs> it's bodies everywhere. Um, so that, that would be one of them. Um, many, many years ago, it was one of those moments that you plan for, but you know, everything's going to happen, you know, like Nicky Featherson scoring his second goal in 209 games. Um, it was the last day of the season, and last days are always really important. You, I mean, you've got to get it right. You can't say somebody is relegated when they're not. So, you know, it's a, it's a desperate mistake. Um, so it would be in the late 90s when um, Scarborough and Carlisle United uh, were battling to avoid the last relegation place from the Football League. And Carlisle had, had um, taken on a goalkeeper called Jimmy Glass. And I knew about him because Hartlepool had been, surprisingly, had been involved in the relegation battle as well. And it was my view that he shouldn't be allowed to play for Carlisle because it was meant to be an emergency loan. And it wasn't an emergency in my view because they'd sold their previous goalkeeper. You know, they'd made that decision. But anyway, I knew all about Jimmy Glass, absolutely everything about Jimmy Glass, just in case we were involved in, a, in, in that relegation fight. We weren't. But Scarborough, Scarborough's game had finished first. Um, and as it stood, unless Carlisle scored, Scarborough would stay in the Football League and Carlisle would go out. And we had pictures coming in um, from Carlisle of the match. And of course, it's the 95th minute or whatever, and the goalkeeper, Jimmy Glass, has gone up for a corner in the 95th minute and he scores. Yeah. And Carlisle stay in the Football League and Scarborough go out. And I knew everything about Jimmy Glass from his birthday to the number of kids that he had, you know, to what he liked to eat. I knew the loss. And it was great. I mean, I, you know, for a couple of minutes, it was, you know, all of my dreams come true. All that preparation had paid dividends. It was, it was fantastic. I mean, I had a similar incident with, um, with Gareth Jellyman, who um, played for was Boston United, something like that. And um, don't ask me why, but I'd looked through his career, and he played for like 15 years, and he'd had one yellow card. Oh, that's a real shame, because if he was to be sent off, I could say Gareth Jellyman sent off, you know, let's, let's hope he hasn't thrown a wobbly. And it's never going to happen, it's never going to happen, never going to happen. 
But suddenly, one week, at about quarter to five, and all the results are coming in. Manchester United, you name it, all coming in. And suddenly, Boston United, Gareth Jellyman, sent off. Ah, now again, I feel like punching the air. <laughs> you know, to hell with Manchester United or Liverpool or whatever. I was going to get this line in. Gareth Jellyman of Boston United has been sent off. Let's hope he hasn't thrown a wobbly. And bang, that was it. It was... It's a pathetically satisfying moment, you know? And I managed to write a book with that. That was the title, Jellyman's Thrown a Wobbly, you know? So, anyway. Uh, yes, Andy. Talking there about preparation, do you find it easy to immerse yourself with everything? So, for example, if you're host, like hosting a sharp music show, yeah. just as an example, would you find that as easy to research as you do the football? Yeah, why, why not? I mean, why not, you know? I mean, within, uh, you know, within Soccer Saturday, I'm you know, we sometimes, for instance, with music, you know, occasionally make a, you know, a musical reference and such like, which means a, a bit of research on it beforehand, you know? Um, I would just, just a little bit. Uh, I would give you an example. It's a, it's a, if you've watched Soccer Saturday, you'll know the terrible, corny lines that, that, that come out of the show. There was a, a team, Sterling Albion, last year, who had four players in, all called Smith. I can't remember the names. It's Chris Smith, Darren Smith, Darren L. Smith and Gordon Smith, you know, the Smiths, and they were relegated, heaven knows they're miserable now, you know, that's the, um, so yeah, but look, I think honestly, any, any walk of life, and not just journalism, I think any walk of life, preparation is just hugely important, you know, pilot doesn't get on board a plane, does he, you know, and I think, okay, I'll just fly this thing, you know, there's check, 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 you know, preparation all the time. You know, whatever walk of life. Yes, mate, aye. What's the deadline there? It's okay for me because I'm not involved in it, thankfully, you know. Um, well, it, it's become a, you know, a special day for Sky, you know, uh, and particularly for Jim White, you know. Who's, well, he's, I would, you know, it goes back to finding a niche, doesn't it, in some respects, because, you know, Whitey has, has made that his own. And in the same way, you know, as I wouldn't be in that seat on a Saturday afternoon, you know, come hell or high water. Transfer deadline day, Jim White will be there, you know, probably wearing his yellow tie or whatever. And he, he's made it his own, and he's made it an event, a, a twice yearly event. Um, you know, and there is a bit of a buzz goes around Sky when it comes to transfer deadline day, especially, you know, later in the evening. It, it's more difficult, you know, because people have become accustomed to it, so you, you get crowds of people behind the reporters. Making, um, you know, making remarks that they think are funny, but the, the, the nation in general would not enjoy hearing. Um, so so that's, that's tricky. This, this transfer deadline will be really interesting because January will probably, will, will certainly be the biggest transfer deadline day ever because of the significance of staying in the Premier League next season when money is absolutely huge. So everybody down there will be spending big to try and make sure they can stay in there. But, you know. It, it, it's, it's a, I'm glad it's only twice a year, you know, because it's manic, but um, I enjoy sitting at home and watching it. So. Uh, I'll go in the red and I'll come back to you, yeah. Oh. Um, well, that's really hard to say because they, they, there's so many of them offer different things, you know. I mean, uh, Phil Thompson's a big mate of mine, he's always got an opinion. Um, you know, Jamie Redknapp, I like a lot. Uh, oh, if you look back, you know, Roddy Marsh did what he was intended to do in the early days of the show. They wanted him to be controversial. They wanted him to be spiky. Um, so I enjoyed working with him. Um, and George Best was a legend, you know. I mean, George was the quietest man on earth when he was in the, on the panel, so it wasn't easy in that sense. But I was always aware that... You know, this was George Best, and I was sitting next to him, you know? It was just, um, so l lots of different people, really. Sorry, I mean, it's not a straight answer, but. Yeah, hi, mate. Uh, hi, um, I would you say the opportunity to work with Jellison would be limited. How would I what? Sorry, say again. Um, well, how would the opportunity to work with Jellison quite gradually, for example, be like, would it be limited, or is well, it Well, not that well. <laughs> I say that, I mean, the thing is now, it, it's just different than it was in, in my day. You know, there were opportunities in journalism, and there still are. You know, there still are, but they're just in different spheres, that's all. Um, 
you know, the, I, I remember doing something like this, uh, you know, a couple of years ago uh, up at, um, at Teesside, and a girl came up to me afterwards and, and, and asked me X, Y, and Z. Um, and for instance, I mean, she's, you know, she's working in the boxing department at Sky now. Um, you, you, you get kids who, who, who come in, some straight from school, some who are graduates, might come on work experience, you know, um, and, and get their faces known. I, I, I think that's the same right across the business. You know, you, you, you get there. You're in an incredibly advantageous position once you're inside the door. You know, because obviously then jobs are advertised internally as well as externally, but more often than not, they'll go to an internal candidate. Um, so th there are still opportunities. I, I think the big thing is what I was trying to say was, you may not see it as the ideal opportunity, you know. Your first job in, in, in the media might not be, you know, what, you're, what you'd imagined. It might not be that perfect job. But I would, I would say to you that the importance of getting your foot in that door just outweighs anything else. You know, that's the first thing. Get in. You know, if you love football and somebody offers you a job doing hockey, you know, take it. Get in the, in the door and, 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 and go from there. Uh, th there are probably, you know, just as many opportunities now as there have been in, in years gone by, but just different opportunities, that's all. One final question. Hey, mate. Yeah. You're all right, mate. How are you doing? Yeah. So, um, in terms of preparation, uh, I know it's really important. Um, like including research and everything. However, compared to your first lot of TV show and now, what's different in the way you prepare? Is there anything different? Um, do yeah, I do a lot more of it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, a lot more of it. You know, um, when I first started to do uh, Soccer Saturday, I mean, I, I felt I could come into the, into the offices on a Friday and I'd do all my preparation on, on Friday, but now, I tend to start it on Wednesday, you know. I'm between Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, um, you know, and I've recorded every single football program, whether it be the Football League show or Match of the Day or whatever, and make sure I've seen all that. We didn't do that in the early days. Um, I remember we had a, a, a Scottish uh, deputy head of sport at, at, at Sky. And when it came to Scottish scores, you know, I used to just read what it said on the video printer basically and knew nothing about the clubs, nothing about anything. It's why you used to learn the name of the grounds, you know. And now I do just as much on Scottish football uh, as I do, you know, on the Premier League. And the same with the conference, you know. So all I would say was there's a lot more now than, than there used to be. I think partly because people expect it. You know, when, when the show first started off, it was something different. And the, the thing that people talked about, you know, weren't the stats, really, weren't the statistics. Um, so I didn't do as much work on them. And now a lot of people talk about, you know, the amount of facts, the amount of statistics, and how do you know this, and how do you know that, and, you know. So they expect to hear them, you know, so I have to deliver them. So y y you put that much more work into them, I think. Yeah. Okay, the turn for Joe. Please, Mike. That was okay. Thank you.